so you know how many times you ever hear me telling you this that I don't know what I'm going to talk about and sometimes I kind of go back over old notes and then I get inspired around something and you know there's always this kind of oh no sort of nervousness and then I notice it I kind of let it go and then I just wait I check in with my body to see how uptight I might feel about whether I feel pressured to figure out what I'm going to say. And um, usually there's enough relaxation around it to say, okay, well, something will arise. And I usually start to think about something the night before, and I give myself the night before and the day of. And um, I didn't know yesterday. I had some things in my mind. But it's very interesting when... Um, I think I'm starting to put into practice trusting the moment and what what arises in the moment as always being a learning opportunity or a teaching moment to me. So I didn't know what I was going to think about or whatever. It's always the Dharma somehow. And I was inspired this morning by my partner and I, I asked him if he could give me permission to talk about this because, you know, if we have an animal or a person around us, that's usually something that um, um, inspires us to notice our practice. And um, so he woke up this morning at about five o'clock and he was having a dream that he had like inconsolable grief. He was crying and crying and crying. He was crying in his dream. He was stuck in his dream and he was, it woke me up because he was crying. And um, he talked to me a little bit about it and he talked about it as inconsolable grief. Feelings of loss from old friendships that he has not been in contact with for a while, um, COVID or not. Um, and he was had this sense of feeling lost and detached from all of those friendships and connections. And it got me thinking, you've probably heard me before talk about, you know, working with emotions. And it just, it just brought me into how to be with our emotions with kindness and have compassion also. And attending, it's all the Dharma things, attending to the breath and feeling where these tensions might be in the body and letting mindfulness be present calling on the wisdom of awareness to hold all that arises with compassion. And I started thinking about this and after I consoled him for a while and things settled down a little, I just, you know, kind of typed a few notes in my notes section on my phone. Um, and, you know, what I'm saying now is sort of what came about of how we deal with various emotions as they arise. And this can also be true of happiness and joy that if we, um, if we bring kindness to ourselves immediately, like we do in our sitting practice, when I first start us in our sitting practice of bringing kindness, and we attend to the breath and what's happening in the body um, we're not as lost in the storyline and we can have compassion for ourselves while we're going through whatever that emotion might be. Um, so that is calling on wisdom, the wisdom of, of awareness to hold everything that's arising with compassion. And it led me also to think about emerging from the pandemic. And there are so many more emotions that I notice people having and expressing because of the 
variety of fears and anxieties and excitements and joys. There are so many emotions around interacting with people again. Uh, and that we have to cradle our weaknesses and nurture our strengths. And for me, I noticed as I was, you know, kind of thinking about all this, I was laying in bed looking out my window and I have some big trees from my neighbors that come right up to my window. And I find that this sense of nurturing can be, um, I don't know, heightened or encouraged by looking to nature and also understanding that it is nature that we talk about in as we're going through the practice that um, as Sayada Utejaniya especially talks about everything is nature our breath is all these parts of nature our body is all these parts of nature earth water fire air uh, nothing that we can grasp onto and so we hold ourselves gently and realize that this is all part of nature arising and passing away. Uh, challenging inconsolable grief or excitement and joy about dancing tango again in my world. Um, all of those emotions, extreme or even in the middle, are a part of nature. And sometimes I sort of literally take that by staring out the window at the trees or at the sky and having that um, sense of no separate self. Just looking out the window or taking the opportunity to walk down the street and go slow enough to look at nature, look at the simplicity of everything coming together, the elements coming together, and we're the same way, elements coming together. Um, you know, and if we're lucky, we get a chance maybe to walk in a forest somewhere or at the beach someplace, but how do we hold the emotion of our crying inner child or our grieving adult? And can we be with it? in its fullest? And can we be with the complexities with bare attention, with just wisdom, you know, kindness, compassion, and wisdom together, the two wings of the Dharma? Can we be with the complexities with attention and with that compassion so that we can by seeing it and being with what's arising, knowing, really knowing by the, by the feel of it, and also noting the transient nature of the experience. As I was with him this morning, you know, things passed over time. It, it took a while, but you know, as we know from our meditative experience, all things arise and pass away and they are transient. Some things take longer. We have to hold them more gently or with more compassion for ourselves. And then I thought it was sort of interesting that I opened up my email and I get the um, sayings of Sayada Utejaniya every day. And for today, the quote was, right view is the idea that mental and bodily processes are nature. They have their own nature and they're showing that nature to us. Right view is the idea that mental and bodily processes are nature. They have their own nature and they're showing that nature to us. Now, the nature that we see by those things is usually back to the, the um, Four Noble Truths. The nature of things that are conditioned to be permanent, the nature of them to last for a certain amount of time, and then the nature of them passing away. 
and there's always something to learn from. And the rest of his quote was, if we can tap into this truth, then we won't struggle so much. We won't be buying into the story, why is this happening to me? So I'm gonna read that quote without my interjections. Right view is the idea that mental and bodily processes are nature. They have their own nature and they're showing that nature to us. That's something to learn from. If we can tap into this truth, then we won't struggle so much. We won't be buying into the story, why is this happening to me? And that very naturally led me into right view, the, you know, the first of the uh, Eightfold Path. The central view of the Buddhist teaching is a middle way. And it's avoiding the extremes of what at the time that he was practicing, excessive, aggressive asceticism, being harsh with oneself and others. And then the laissez-faire sort of indulgence or a kind of spiritual laziness was the, the other side of things. And so we approach all our experience with a basic friendliness and respect. And in the context of meditation practice, this means gently placing our awareness on our bodies and minds in not too tight, not too loose manner, which is why you always hear me saying, just the right amount of effort, not too much, just enough. And without the view of fundamental loving kindness, the kindness for ourselves, there isn't really mindfulness meditation. We have to have the, the view of loving kindness and practicing mindfulness as, you know, like sort of gymnastics, uh, that's, th that leaves us feeling more depleted. And some kinds of mindfulness are sort of taught that way. But here we're talking about a fundamental of having loving kindness present and mindfulness is then at the fore to uh, be with the experience that's happening. And that's what's called right view. Experiences the heart of the matter but we need to first understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and how mindfulness relates to the rest of our lives. And, you know, in this, this culture, it's sort of the just do it culture. And it's, it has a well-worn familiarity of that mantra, jumping into mindfulness practice without first contemplating the view seems like a, an attractive option. So why study the classic teachings on meditation when the main point is to practice? But isn't the whole point not to think too much about it? Some people kind of say, but the Buddha wisely suggested study and contemplation as supports to any practice. So we have the experience on the one hand and we have investigation um, to, you know, we try to learn some of these lists. We try to understand what the Four Noble Truths are and what the Eightfold Path is. And yes, the experience is the heart of the matter. But we also have to understand, you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it and how mindfulness relates to the rest of our lives. And that's where this idea of right view comes in. Um, you know, I like quoting Gil Fronsdale. One of his talks on his website, I think, is where I got it. He talks about, he's got a long, great introductory. In fact, maybe I'll um, try to copy the link and put it in the um, chat box. But um, for the Buddhist path, the orienting um, perspective or right, right view is the practice of keeping an eye on our relationship to whatever we're experiencing. And this is what, you know, came up for me this morning in consoling Bill and being with him through what he was experiencing and finding, you know, this way of 
thinking about how can we handle our how can we handle our emotions um, and that's keeping an eye on our relationship to whatever we're experiencing and so you know classically it's described as using the perspective of the four noble truths we notice that something that, that suffering is happening that things are um, uncomfortable and uh, as we look at them deeper we realize that they are it's a it's as a result of clinging and craving and grasping and then the the eightfold path is laid out as the fourth noble truth for us and right there at the beginning of the eightfold path is right view right intention uh, and so rather than getting caught up in our opinions and abstract interpretations of what we experience in this approach we ask ourselves a series of questions you know do we feel any stress what's happening in the mind right now what's happening in the body do we feel stress do we feel discomfort or suffering in how we're relating to what's happening or what's not happening we might ask ourselves that in our meditation process you know ah, what's happening in the mind right now do we feel any stress how are we we relating to what's happening are we clinging to it are we attached to it are we pushing it away uh, so right there we are having a constantly you know daily life experience of living the four noble truths and what are we clinging to that's contributing to the suffering so right view includes the encouraging perspective that clinging and its resulting suffering can be brought to an end it also orients us to the practices of the entire eightfold path as the easiest and clearest path to liberation from suffering right view isn't meant to be the only perspective that we view our life from other perspectives can be necessary for other purposes but in order to walk the buddha's path to freedom right view is an essential ingredient and it's the perspective needed to find the path and to stay on the path so practicing right view doesn't require believing in something that we can't know for ourselves. It doesn't rely on supernatural or mystical beliefs, and it doesn't require us to be ahead of where we are. It just requires us to be in the present moment to notice, is there stress here? Is there suffering here? What am I clinging to? So pursuing a path involves walking here we are back to nature you know kind of pursuing the path involves walking where we are on the path we can't walk on what lies ahead until we reach it so we're just walking on the path of being in the very present moment and realizing that it is all part of nature and we have we cultivate the right view to see whether we are clinging and to notice if we have suffering and incline our mind toward the skillful of letting go of what we're clinging to and i just sort of bring that back bring that back around to um the same goes for our emotional you know, noticing our emotions and clinging whether we're clinging to wanting something to be different than how it is because you know here's my partner waking up crying in unconsolable grief and of course he wants it different than the way it is but we can't get we can't push things away because they just don't leave 
fast enough. They just are where they are. And that's where we embrace kindness and compassion and the wisdom to being our own gatekeeper. We're the keepers of our, um, keepers of our what? Keepers of our, well, we contain, we contain ourselves with kindness and compassion so that we can really see clearly what's happening without getting so wrapped up in our storyline. So I think that's all I'll say about it for now because I think that's plenty of how we deal with emotion, with kindness and wisdom and we become our own gatekeepers for our freedom and peacefulness. So, thank you for listening to the Dhamma. Take a few moments to let the words settle down and we'll have some conversation.